uh, what Fred wanted me to do was to uh, go through a few of the events in our history that has helped us to put together our uh, plans that we have today for fighting fire in the, both in the swamp and in the uplands. Um, and in, in the beginning of this, I, I think back to one of the fires we had uh, several years ago. It was called the Honeybuck Fire. And um, it, this was uh, uh, an escape prescribed fire like a number of others of ours. But anyhow, uh, it, it was in its wind down stage and we had a, a, a volunteer fire department crew on Jones's Island uh, for whatever we needed them for. And uh, the, uh, the IC asked me to have them to drive down to the other end of the island to check on something that was uh, uh, supposed to be burning out or some, some rather mundane uh, a chore. But anyhow, I asked them to do it and they, they all jumped into their truck and they were real enthusiastic and they, they uh, started the engine and turned on the siren and, and turned on the lights and raced a half mile down to where they were going and then slammed on the brakes and, and got out and, and did the, what they were supposed to do. Well, there's nothing wrong with being enthusiastic about an assignment, but there is something about, a, about fighting fire that gets our adrenaline uh, uh, raging. Uh, even though we know better, we want to jump into it with both feet no matter what. Uh, because uh, wildfire is bad, it's our enemy, and it must be destroyed. Well, fire can be our enemy, but it can also be our friend and our environment's friend. Uh, with experience, uh, fire managers have learned how to have patience with fire, how to work with it instead of fighting it, and how to make it less of an enemy and more of a friend. We also learned that each habitat has its own particular set of problems. Uh, for instance, managing fire within the Okefenokee Swamp is different from almost any other habitat that we have uh, in this country, including the, uh, the cultivated bogs up in, in Michigan and the, around the Lake States and in the Northeast. Um, well, these lessons are all not new. In fact, uh, history shows that, that uh, we often learn them over and over again. Uh, the problem is that uh, wet and dry periods and the resulting uh, difficult fire years tend to occur in cycles. In this area, these cycles tend to occur every 10 to 30 years. Uh, during the period between cycles, entire management staffs can change, priorities change, uh, current management plans are replaced, and and the files that tell our history are in the archives. That's uh, why we're here today to, um, uh, we, we have to document the lessons that we have learned in the past in a form that will survive through uh, maybe long periods when fire suppression isn't an emergency and when everything just becomes kind of mundane so we can remain ready to cope with the year when it uh, once again becomes a major priority and, uh, and, and uh, I think like the title was on there, uh, how to, to deal with something unexpected. Well, um, <clears throat> I'm going to uh, go over some of our history and go over some of our fires in the past. And these may not be the most spectacular fires that we've had, but they're going to be those that were kind of stepping stones uh, in our uh, development of our, our management uh, uh, techniques uh, that we have learned over over the years. Um, if we can uh, go to the first first slide here, we'll notice that the um, uh, uh, like you might expect, we these are you can see the years when we have a high precip high amount of precipitation, and um, uh, years when we when it's uh, when it's low. Um, and, and obviously, our fires occur during the years when we, uh, when we have little rain. And uh, right to begin with, let's have the next slide. Right to begin with, uh, these are fires that occurred uh, during the beginning times uh, before the refuge was established between 1855 and 1927. Now, back during this period, <coughs> uh, the fire managers, managers kind of had this little rule. When the swamp uh, water level was high, 
uh, they do, they make the best use of the swamp they could and do everything they could to try to run the fire into the swamp so they had one less line to worry about and there the fire would go out on that side. When water levels in the swamp were low, uh, if they had a fire on the upland, they'd do everything in their power to keep the fire out of the swamp because they knew that once it got in there, we were in for a long period of trouble. Well, uh, uh, next slide, please. The, the, um, the next dry period uh, was in the early 30s, and, uh, and we had uh, a major fire in 1932. That's the, the pink area there that you can see, and, and uh, according to John Hopkins, it covered most of the swamp, and, and as you can see there, it didn't exactly cover most of the swamp, but probably as he looked at it, it did. It covered a lot of it. But uh, the spring of 1932 was very dry, and uh, there was a, a fishing party somewhere in the vicinity of Mixon's Hammock, and there was a youth within the party that decided his hands were cold, and he started a little fire in the grass to try to warm his hands, and uh, uh, the fire got away, and they left it. Well, the uh, wind blew hard in one direction and spread the fire one way, then uh, it shifted and spread the fire another way, uh, and, it, and it covered much of the swamp. And according to uh, John Hopkins, John Hopkins, by the way, was the, was the uh, project leader for the Hebert Cypress Company during the uh, timber operations when they, they logged the cypress out of most of the swamp. Then when the government acquired the, uh, uh, the land in 1937, he became our first refuge manager. When he retired in 1945, he wrote a book and, um, and, and I have excerpts here from, uh, I think it's just four pages in his books, things that he learned from this 1932 fire. <clears throat> uh, he mentioned that uh, it was the, the um, prairie areas were very dry in the swamp, and one of the observations that he noted was that the fire would burn over an area, it could dry out more, and then it would burn back over the area again. Uh, and so repeat burning occurred as the muck dried out. Um, and he made the statement at that time. He said, no equipment known at that time would have been of any value to control or suppress the fire in the swamp. Uh, the timber owners around the swamp made no attempt to suppress the fire in the swamp, but fought fire out in the uplands where suppression was possible. Uh, he also noted that where prescribed burning had been practiced on the uplands, it, uh, it helped their uh, suppression efforts, and where the fire did burn over at those areas, the damage was minimized. And he also noted that this area has been subjected to fire since time out of mind. A fair stand of good pine was found here by the European settlers when they came, and uh, his <coughs> conclusion was the pine woods has adapted to fire, and most damage on the upland was limited to turpentine areas. He also found after the fire, they examined, um, he and his staff examined the burned area very carefully. He found very little dead wildlife and observed that native wildlife uh, had a natural ability to survive or recover or adapt to wildfire. And his conclusions as he uh, uh, was that um, fires in our piney woods thought at first to be damaging, have instead been beneficial, and he said, I am not alone in that thought. <clears throat> well, then we entered, let's have the next slide, please. Uh, then we entered a new period. Um, uh, if you notice, between 1950 and 1955, we have another low precipitation period, and we have fires that are way up at the top of the, off the chart there. Uh, this, these were the 1954-55 fires. Now, <clears throat> in between, we went through a wet period, and things had changed somewhat during this time. Uh, for one thing, uh, prescribed burning that had uh, taken place around the swamp rather informally. Uh, uh, these, these were the, the years that we began our fire suppression actions, uh, when the, we first began to get the idea that fire was bad. And we had... Uh, uh, private landowners that would burn every uh, spring uh, to develop forage for their cattle, 
and they were discouraged from doing this. There was still quite a lot of prescribed burning going on, but a lot of it had been curtailed. Um, <clears throat> and now, as time as we enter 1954, we're just beginning to go into a rather extended dry cycle. And, and I have several notes from um, refuge manager Roy Moore's um, fire um, reports. And, and, uh, and up to this point, they were using this old axiom, well, you know, if the fire burns into the swamp, that's good, it'll go out there. <clears throat> In July 1951, Mitchell's Island caught fire. There was no suppression action taken. The fire burned out at the edge of the island, and there was very little damage to the timber. Okay, in August 1952, compartment 15 burned. The upland was suppressed. The fire was allowed to burn into the swamp where it went out. January into March 1953, two fires in upland compartments 13 and 15 burned. The fire was suppressed in the upland. The fire went out at the edge of the swamp. July 1954, the same thing, Billy's Island burned. A comment by refuge manager Moore that the wildlife habitat, which had deteriorated since they quit burning on the island, um, had, uh, uh, had benefited due to the wildfire. Then August 15, 1954, Blackjack Island burned. He said, all of it, but the fire went out at the edge of the swamp. Uh, Right here, we're at the point where we are turning the page between the time when they, they should have worried about the fire in the swamp. Now, the next entry, the next report was September 10, 1954, uh, less than a month afterwards. And the report noted that the Black Jack Island fire did not go out as, as had been thought, um, but the fire continued to burn, smolder into the swamp until it burned onto Mims Island. Mims Island burned over. November 31, 1954, uh, fire on Fiddler's Island. And uh, again, the refuge manager noted that the damage was limited because they'd had a wildfire here uh, a few years before. And he didn't mention whether the fire had just burned across the swamp to, let's have the next slide, please. Uh, he, he didn't ma mention whether the fire had burned across the swamp to Fiddler's Island. If, uh, if I can make this thing work here. Okay, um, <clears throat> Billy's Island is here, um, Black Jack Island is here, and the, here's where the fire started on Black Jack Island. It smoldered through the swamp until it got onto Mims Island right here. Then, uh, then we had the fire on uh, Fiddler's Island. And I don't know whether the fire burned across to Fiddler's Island or whether we had a new strike on Fiddler's Island and it went into the swamp from there. But, but this gray area, the, the major fire had completely encompassed the whole area. <clears throat> then um, in November 20, on November 27, 1954, the classic fire began, the, the mule tail fire. And uh, let's, um, uh, let's go back to the, the previous slide there. The, this is the classic fire where reports tell us that uh, a turpentine or someplace in the southeast side of the swamp uh, got cold and he built a, a little fire in a pot and put it in the front of the wagon. And according to the legend, uh, the mule was pulling the wagon, dangled his tail in the uh, burning pot, which uh, upset him. And he went uh, tearing through the woods, spreading fire as he went. <coughs> well, the, the fire, um, the f there were high winds and the fire burned up almost the whole east side of the swamp. And uh, one of the points that refuge manager Roy Moore uh, noted was that uh, they had done regular prescribed burning at Camp Cornelia. Camp Cornelia is where all the buildings are, right in here. And uh, because the fuels were low, the fire burned right through the area, but they were able to save the buildings and control the fire as it went through there. Well, <clears throat> as, as a result of these fires, uh, 90,000 acres of private land burned with destruction of much of the upland timber. Uh, some of Okefenokee's uplands survived because of prescribed fires or wildfires. Uh, areas destroyed included Chesser Island, where 
the refuge manager had been ordered not to burn there anymore. Um, and uh, on Ridley's and Bugaboo Islands, where most of the trees had turpentine faces. And then <clears throat> after, also after these fires, uh, many turpentine face trees throughout the refuge uplands were, uh, uh, that had been partially burned by the fire or were, had been uh, salvaged and removed. And this, of course, uh, uh, reduced the amount of longleaf pine that we had in uh, much of our longleaf pine communities within the swamp. Um, a, a fire review was conducted after the fire, and uh, this is, these are some of the recommendations. The, this fire review con, uh, uh, was conducted by the fire uh, suppression personnel and the landowners that surrounded the swamp. And there were several recommendations that came out of this fire review. One was that a sill should be built across the Suwannee River and certain other places in the swamp to keep the water levels high in the swamp so that a fire like this could never happen again. Second, that a perimeter road, or a road should be built around the perimeter of the swamp to facilitate access uh, near the edge of the swamp by the fire management crews. Third, there should be a break constructed uh, right at the line between the swamp land and the upland uh, to, to help to um, either burn off from or to get uh, suppression crews next to the edge of the swamp. Well, no action was ever taken on the, on the break around the edge of the swamp. The perimeter road was constructed in the early 1960s, and, uh, and we have it today. The Suwannee River Sill was constructed about the same time, and uh, that over time has proven uh, to be not effective in and maintaining the water levels of the swamp. It only maintained a few thousand acres, and actually, from the uh, habitat standpoint, the, the resulting stabilized water levels were detrimental to the habitat. Well, continuing our fire sequence, let's look at the next slide here. <clears throat> uh, in 1981, we uh, got a, caught a fire on uh, Lightning started a fire on Black Jack Island, <clears throat> where the whole thing started in 1954. And uh, we'd had, here again, we'd had years of, uh, of not real uh, uh, emergency type fire weather. <clears throat> and uh, swamp wa the swamp water level had been fairly high. In 1980, uh, the 1980s was another period when it became low. Um, <clears throat> uh, the the fire started on the island, and, uh, and the Georgia Forestry Commission uh, picked us up in the helicopter, and we were going to go try to put the fire out on the island with the helicopter. And the helicopter broke, and so the island burned off. <coughs> and, uh, uh, the f uh, and it did not do a bad job of burning. It did a pretty good job. And then the fire left the island and burned about oh, 900 or 1,000 or so acres within the swamp. And, uh, uh, the, the Forestry Commission got the helicopter fixed, and uh, Mr. Dozer's uh, personnel there were, were kind of adamant about wanting us to, to use that uh, helicopter to put that fire out that was in the swamp there, uh, uh, <coughs> so we wouldn't have a repeat of the 1954 fire. Manager then was John Eady, and we looked at the, uh, we looked at the area around the fire, and we had, uh, uh, some open prairie area around here with water in it, and uh, for one thing, <laughs> one thing we didn't have any fire suppression money, and we really couldn't hire a helicopter to work on a fire in the swamp. But uh, but also we just we thought the fire would go out when it reached that point, and there was a little bit of consternation there because the water kept going down as the fire kept coming closer. But uh, fortunately, the <coughs> the uh, the fire burned up to the edge of the open prairies and it went out at that point. And then later rains uh, suppressed the fire and put it out. But there was always the question after that, would, would the helicopters have been beneficial, <coughs> excuse me, in uh, suppressing the fire in the swamp? And uh, the Forest Service even sent a crew of fire behavior officers. We, you know, we'd, we'd had fires in bog lands throughout the countries and we have fought them there for years and uh, sent a, a crew of fire behavior officers down, and we flew over the area and looked at the, uh, 
the boundary between the burned scrub shrub and the um, and and uh, where the fire occurred and where it didn't occur, and they determined that yes, probably the um, uh, the helicopters would have been beneficial, so that's something we can use in the future if we have another fire like this in the swamp. Well, then a few years after this, uh, and, and, and we did use helicopters for putting out fires in some of the uplands. Uh, uh, they, were, they, were, they were useful to us, and the state was always generous with the use of their helicopter. <coughs> uh, then 1988 happened and Yellowstone, the fire in Yellowstone National Park happened. And as we all know, the, the, uh, the fire really was, that occurred in Yellowstone was beneficial, probably, in most areas. But uh, there weren't really good plans for what to do with a wildfire if it uh, occurred, how it should be managed, and, and this sort of thing. There was a lot of unanswered questions. And so our department uh, heads in Washington decided, they, they handed down the edict that, uh, that <clears throat> when we had a wildfire, or if we had a fire that occurred uh, on uh, Fish and Wildlife Service lands, uh, and there was no prescription that, that said how, when the fire should start and how it should be handled and all this sort of thing, uh, it would be considered a wildfire and it would be aggressively suppressed. So these are the orders that we were under for the next few years. And of course, the, the uh, intended result was that we would have real good fire plans, and so from that point, we'd be able to uh, manage the fires. But we weren't at that point at this time. Um, <clears throat> later, this particular year, in 1988, we had a fire up uh, someplace up in here, on, uh, or rather right here, I believe, on McDonald Island at the edge of the swamp. Not a very big fire, but we had used uh, helicopters a couple of times by then, and refuge manager John Schroer was there then, and we had ordered, uh, let's, let's have the next slide. We had ordered this humongous helicopter, biggest one we'd ever seen on the refuge, I think, had a 450-gallon bucket. And uh, we flew over the fire area, and the refuge manager asked the pilot, he says, uh, can you put this fire out with this helicopter in that big bucket? He says, a piece of cake. <clears throat> and so he dumped a 450-gallon load on the fire, and it didn't do much. He dumped another load on it and didn't do much. He fought it the rest of the day. We had crews in there uh, in the swamp along the... We had this little low line going into the swamp where he'd dump a bucket, and they'd get in there, and they'd try to mix the water and stuff around. And the fire got suppressed, but I don't think that we or the helicopter had much to do with it. <clears throat> uh, then... The next year, we had, uh, with the fire I was talking about right at the beginning, uh, the honeybuck fire. It was an escape prescribed fire. And there we, uh, uh, let's go to, the, go to the next slide. We can be ready for that. Um, there we uh, had a fire. Um, we were burning on, on uh, Honey Island, which is here. And the, the fire escaped and, and started burning toward the pocket. And then, boy, we got all upset about this. And, uh, and, and we in the state got together and did everything we could to stop it. We set, uh, we set a backing fire, I think, six miles all the way from the end from the, to Stephen Foster State Park, clear to the end of the refuge. The, uh, <clears throat> the backing fire that we set escaped and got onto private land. And I don't think that the backing fire and the swamp fire ever met one another. <laughs> so, um, uh, so this operation wasn't, we didn't burn a lot of private land, just a little bit, but this operation wasn't really successful either. Uh, the next year, uh, the next year we had another fire uh, in the vicinity of Bugaboo Island. And this fire took off and burned and, and before we knew it, it was almost up here to Honey Island. And uh, it was momentarily stopped there at a little piece of uh, open area next to Honey Island. And we got all upset about this, and we, here we really turned out. We had helicopters dump water on the fire. We had our folks, we literally built hand line around a lot of that fire. 
just about killed ourselves doing it. And, and when the fire finally uh, s stopped or was suppressed by whatever sometime later, we determined that probably we may have saved maybe one square foot of, of land by, by killing ourselves on this fire. Well, then the real turning point <clears throat> was uh, just later on that same year, a fire started uh, someplace in the vicinity of the swamp here on the west side. Lightning caused fire. Um, and uh, and, and it, it really took off and started burning. And, and we, here we had a, a major, we had several uh, incident management teams on this fire. And let's have the next slide. Okay. Uh, the uh, okay. Let's let's go through through these. Okay. Um, go ahead to the next slide until it changes here. Okay. Uh, we had we had upwards of almost seven hundred people on this fire. We had crews in the swamp working on the fire, building hand line, uh, putting fire out, uh, putting burning embers, jabbing them into the swamp to put them out. Um, we had, uh, next slide, we had helicopters, I don't know how many helicopters of all sizes dumping water in the swamp. Uh, <clears throat> next slide, we even had retardant drops, the, the red stuff falling in the swamp. Um, and water handling crews, we had, we had experts in putting out bog fires from Michigan and the Northeast down there. And we had miles and miles and miles of hose in the swamp and sprinkler systems, uh, everything that we, could, that we could come up with. And uh, uh, for a while, we thought we had the fire stopped at a two or 3,000 acres, but it went on and it burned 23,000 acres. And I think we... Uh, I think we finally de put the, declared the fire out several months later when the, when the rains came. But uh, overall, this fire cost us over $9 million. And uh, it, it did, there was one good thing that resulted from the fire. The, the break that they had uh, suggested be built back in 1955 uh, was started. Uh, we determined that we needed an area. We knew, we decided, we knew to begin with, we couldn't put the fire out in the swamp. We're going to have to uh, attack it when it comes to the edge of the swamp. But we have this transition zone where it makes it kind of hard to fight it right there, and we don't want to let it build up until it gets a half mile inland. So we started this break around the very edge of the swamp, kind of between the, the, uh, um, between the transition area where the swamp starts and the and the upland uh, begins. And we built a break around the, probably the lower, the lower one quarter of the swamp. And by utilizing this break, we were able to uh, uh, attack the fire as it came to the uplands. And we really, rather than to work in the swamp, we were able to uh, do what needed to be done where we thought the fire was going to hit that break on the uplands. And we managed to uh, come out without damaging too much private land. Well, we also had other, we, uh, we learned other lessons throughout the, uh, uh, throughout the, the, the time. Let's have the next slide, please. Um, the reason, why do we have such a problem trying to put out fire within the swamp? Uh, first of all, this is kind of a, a profile of the, of the vegetation in the swamp. We have a, a mixture of things, but a lot of hoorah bush, greenbrier, and other impenetrable um, vegetation that grows anywhere from three to 15 feet high within the swamp. And, uh, and we've got this layer of dead material that falls next to the surface of the root mat. And then uh, below that, we've got the peat layer and the sand. And uh, next slide, please. The, uh, when this burns, uh, we get a tremendous fire we have smoked in Tallahassee with smokes from our fire. Next slide, please. And it's a very hot fire, a very extremely hot fire. And uh, now we can have, uh, let's next slide, please. <coughs> the the uh, water level can be right up to the top of the root mat, and you still have a fire like this. 
Now, when we, if, if the water level is at the top of the root mat, we'll burn off all the surface vegetation. Next slide, please. And uh, you'll see here uh, in the background was where the fire stopped. That's what the vegetation looked like to begin with. This in front here burned last year, and you notice that it is growing up just the way it was before. Next slide, please. Now, if the water level is low enough so we burn into the root mat a little bit, then we'll get uh, a change in vegetation. Next slide, please. Uh, we may have grasses instead of, uh, instead of brush when it, when it comes up. And next slide. And then the classic thing is if it burns down to the peat layer, then we get the, uh, uh, we get the uh, open areas, that, uh, open prairie areas and open lakes. Okay, um, a couple other lessons we learned. Back in 1979, <coughs> uh, when uh, one of our technicians was plowing out uh, a wildfire, uh, he went a couple hundred yards down from the edge of the wildfire in the pocket and uh, was starting to plow out, uh, uh, run a line between the road and the swamp. He had maybe a couple, 300 yards to go. The wind direction changed and within a few seconds, it uh, burned the fire, it blew the fire over him. Uh, he was using this old 1954 tractor at the time and we didn't have any equipment, no money to do anything. And, uh, and he died a few days later in, in the burn uh, center in Texas. Two years later at Merritt Island, we lost two more people. Uh, they were trying to plow a line in front of a fire and they got their tractor on a stump and were burned over. And as a result of this, <coughs> uh, we, got a lot of, uh, we got a lot more money, we got funding, and most of, probably most important of all, we got training uh, so that our folks learn how to put out wildfire. Well, in closing, the, Lessons we learned is one, we can't safely manage fires without adequate uh, fire suppression equipment, personal protection equipment, training and funding. Two, it's impossible to suppress fires in the swamp other than a very small spot fire. Three, it's dangerous and foolhardy to put personnel in the swamp. Travel is hazardous and difficult and personnel may easily become trapped. Four, it's dangerous to put equipment in the swamp, it will get stuck uh, and if you could put if you could put equipment and personnel and anything you wanted to in the swamp, it wouldn't do any good anyhow. Uh, the uh, helicopter drops in the swamp. This vegetation layer is so thick that it atomizes the water when it hits it and it doesn't soak the actual burning area. Uh, you'd have to dump buckets and buckets in a single spot just to put out a little piece of fire. Um, seven, retardant drops just make a real good show. Uh, besides fertilizing the, uh, the vegetation that's, that's there. Uh, eight, if it were possible to create a fire line in the swamp, the chance of it holding anything is zero because there's too much burning stuff in the air. Nine, as they did in 1932, the most effective management technique is to retreat to the upland and fight fire when it gets there. Uh, Ten, managed wildfire used in conjunction with prescribed fire is beneficial in the uplands and in the swamp for both fire suppression and habitat quality. Uh, 11, the surface fire in the stop, swamp stops spreading only when it reaches an open water area. And 12, the fire isn't out until the water level comes up from underneath. And uh, as a result of all of our planning, we did finish the swamp sedge break around the rest of the swamp. And Fred will tell you more about that. We developed a, a plan uh, for uh, when we would fight fire in the swamp, when we wouldn't. And we've also developed a series of, um, of uh, dip sites throughout the swamp so that we can use helicopters to help us when the fire uh, comes to the upland. And thank you very much. Thanks.